So in this segment, we're going to be talking about farmers slamming the UK government's contradictory agricultural policies and, you know, farmers finally understanding the problems, which, you know, took a time. The NFU are exempt from that criticism because they've been doing great work for a while. Um, you know, they were against Brexit in the first place, so um, fair play to them. But, um, you know, Minette Batter is really going after the government and some of the other farmers are as well. So, um, the president of the National Farmers Union has attacked Johnson's government for completely contradictory policies that show a lack of understanding of how food production works in a ramping up of rhetoric from the UK's largest farming group. And, you know, we've spoken about this uh, previously. The, the whole the UK's kind of whole thing is like, oh, we want to pursue net zero at home, but we want to import more food from Australia and New Zealand, despite the carbon footprint that creates. It's just wild. And British farmers are kind of not understanding what they're meant to do because it's really unclear on how to get the subsidies um, before they got subsidies based on how much land they own but now it's about oh how much are you giving back to the environment but how do you measure that um, in terms of success and how do you give finances based on that that's the kind of thing I don't understand and I don't think a lot of farmers do either because it's not been explained to them so Minette Batters told the NFU's annual conference that after a labour crisis which is caused by the end of freedom of movement a controversial subsidy overhaul which is something that um, the Tory government did on purpose and a trade deal with Australia that is expected to cut into the UK's farm output. And you've got three different things here, which we've spoken about previously. The end of freedom of movement. We've saw firsthand how bad that was when it came to um, essentially farmers having to cull pigs. Um, but we also saw that with you know f um, good you know fruit and vegetables rotting in the fields because they didn't have the staff to pick them. So we've seen you know this staff crisis in multiple uh, different areas really of farming. And we're going to see that more as the kind of, I, I don't know, is the, the reverse of a harvest, the sowing season happens. I don't know if there's got like a specific phrase for it, but, you know, the planting season's here and they're going to have problems with that. You know, daffodils was another were another problem where they couldn't get enough staff to pick them and even exporting daffodils is a nightmare now as well. So that's, that's a huge problem. The, the subsidies we will speak about in a bit. Um, and the trade deals, you know, we've done trade deals with agricultural powers like Australia and New Zealand who are very export orientated and that's going to cut into the farmers, um, essentially the farmers um, products at the end of the day, there's going to be more competition on the market. The UK government's energy and ambition for our countryside seems to be almost entirely focused on anything other than domestic food production and the, the thing is right, food security is so important for any country. Um, you know, having control over food because you know if there is a crisis you can reduce exports um, in order to protect the domestic market that's something I think Hungary are actually doing now by um, reducing the amount of um, wheat um, they're exporting I think I saw something sort of story around that because you know the wheat's going to be impacted now global wheat will in be impacted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine so food security is very important and you know the NFU obviously recognize that um, but they do have a vested interest in protecting farmers overall. But she says we need a plan that preempts crisis rather than repeatedly running into them. And that's the Tory mantra, just constantly running into crises after crisis. The speech marks the extent of farmers' disillusionment with the Conservative government, despite the party's long-standing links with rural areas. And we might actually see some change here when it comes to farmers' support of Tories, which is great, to be honest. The NFU and other farming lobby groups have attempted to influence post-Brexit policies on subsidies, trade and immigration, but have faced repeated setbacks because at the end of the day, the Tories have moved away from farmers now. They've, I think they're focusing everything on the Red Wall by the looks of it because these are farmers in the South, typically. But has accused the government of raising the bar for environmental standards at home, which I wasn't aware of, but fair enough. Um, but pursuing trade deals that support lower standards overseas, claiming to value domestic food production, but making it difficult to find workers, stating there are many export opportunities for British food, but failing to prioritise the resources to open up those new markets. But the thing is, I'm not sure which new markets she's talking about, because if you're going to buy um, beef, right, if you want to buy beef from um, you know a more agricultural orientated country, say you're China, for example, right, or South Korea, are you really going to buy um, beef from Britain that's really far away or are you going to look at New Zealand or Australia, which they already do? You're going to look at those countries because of geography predominantly. So it doesn't make sense that, you know, these are new uh, British markets. I do remember Liz Truss infamously talking about pork markets in China, but I'm not sure how big a market that will be for British uh, farmers in the future.
She cited the example of a labour shortage in the abattoir sector, which is something we spoke about a lot of, that is linked to post-Brexit immigration restrictions, which resulted in the culling of 40,000 pigs, while another 200,000 animals are backed up on farms, placing intense financial pressure on pig farmers. And, you know, these farms aren't designed to hold a lot of animals. They're designed to essentially, um, you know, rear them and then take them to the slaughterhouse to be processed, um, killed and processed. But the thing is, without that system in place, it it creates huge problems. We saw that in America during the pandemic, where essentially these pigs were um, over the, the size that slaughterhouses normally accept. And that caused huge problems for America. And, you know, in the UK, we're facing similar problems now, not necessarily because of the sizing issue, but because of the fact that um, we don't have the, the butchers and uh, staff and abattoirs to process them. An Australian trade deal agreed in December has also angered farmers and prompted concerns over future post-Brexit post agreements after the government's impact assessment projected a £94 million hit to growth in UK agriculture. And, you know, we do need farmers. Like, it doesn't matter how advanced you are. Unless you can grow food in a lab that's sustainable and can feed... Um, vast amounts of people it, it doesn't it doesn't work along with steep rises in the cost of fertilizer which you know that might be one of the things we import these things might be the things that we import from the eu as well which has gotten far more expensive feed and other inputs that are concerns about the post-brexit green subsidy scheme which will be rolled out over the next five years to replace the eu's common agricultural policy which is actually less th than what the eu offered previously um, scotland and wales are trying to do their best to kind of um, reduce the subsidies slower um, because they want their farmers to survive longer but the simple fact is it doesn't look like the Tories do. We're going to talk about in this article over here about farmers who are angry over the green payments with no incentive to grow food and the simple fact is we I know I've mentioned it before but essentially the Tories are going to be paying people not to grow food and yes it's great that that land's going to be given back for environmental reasons but um, how are farmers supposed to make money off that? Because they don't just make money off the subsidies. They make money off the actual animals that they sell. You can't really do that with environmental projects unless you're selling access to them, which I, d I don't think many people would pay for. That is called the government's new environmental land management scheme, which aims to pay farmers and landowners for environmental work, a payment system almost in opposition to food production, and said sustainable farming incentive, the part of the scheme aimed at the majority of farmers, was at risk of barely producing a profit for them. And, you know, the NFU have noticed that as well. Like, how are farms supposed to make a profit off environmental projects? At the end of the day, a farm is a business. She says, the country needs a strategy and a clear vision for what we expect from British farming. The problem is the Tories don't understand strategies or visions. They just kind of meander from one problem to another problem. George, Environment Secretary, told farmers at the same event that ministers were committed to designing our future policies together with industry. But the thing is, you know, credit to her, Minette Batters has been trying to talk to government ministers to try and get something for farmers to really help them, but the government haven't been listening. And, you know, these green policies they come up with are, you know, a symptom of the government not listening. He added that they were adjusting schemes aiming to help pig farmers, such as private storage offering for pig meat. I mean, again, I, I, is that for slaughtered meat? I, I don't know. And the thing is, who's going to be paying for this? Taxpayers? When the simple fact is, without freedom of movement, certain ag you know industries die. To make them useful to more farmers, I mean, it's a joke. Although he declined to offer direct financial support to farms, which they desperately need, but beyond that, they need you know skilled butchers and things like that to process the animals. And the simple fact is we don't train enough in the UK. It's not a desired job. It's a really difficult job. It doesn't pay enough, honestly. And yes, they deserve more pay, but at the same time, unless we're actively going out of our way to train butchers, uh, train people to become butchers, it doesn't work. The system doesn't work. George faced tough questions from farmers, including um, on past pledges that the UK would not import food under post-Brexit trade deals that was grown or reared to lower standards than those imposed in the UK. And then George come back with, generally, if you if you look at our animal welfare outcomes, there's a strong degree of equivalence between the UK and Australia. And I don't know what he means by that. I don't know if he means like there are less diseases or something. But yes, the the the, the outcome for the animals is they're going to be slaughtered. So, yes, by that degree, we and almost every other country in the world have similar outcomes for animals. But if we actually look at what Australia allows compared to the UK, and these farmers here actually have a point, the farmers in the blue highlighter here. If you have a look, battery cage hens legal in Australia, 
banned in the UK since 2012. So stalls, banned um, since 99, allowed in Australia. Hormone fed beef, banned in the UK, allowed in Australia. Hot branding, allowed in Australia, banned in the UK. Musling, I'm not sure what that is, but it's illegal in the UK and it's legal in Australia. Slaughterhouse CCTV, not required. Been mandatory in the UK since 2018. Bit late to that, but alright, I'll give you a pass. Um, up to The UK allows up to 24 hours without food and water on track to end live exports. Um, oh, we're on track to end live exports, okay. That should be less than 24 hours, you know. Animals shouldn't be cooped up without food or water for... 24 hours like that but okay that's our system australia is 48 hours um in intense heat without food or water that's intense heat so what is the system outside of intense heat george care to tell the rest of the class but um honestly it's a joke um george's answer here's a joke i think the farmers know it the question is what are the farmers going to do um we already covered a story where you know one farmer's not going to vote tory so the question is is he not going to vote or is he going to do a tactical vote or a protest vote that's what we'll see but the simple fact is voting for you know the reform party or ukip party wouldn't make sense because they would do similar things to this because this is what they wanted the main the main problems for the agricultural industry right has been caused predominantly by brexit if we look at this right a labor crisis that's been caused by the end of freedom of movement controversial subsidy overhaul that's a tory party dogma but still a byproduct of brexit and a trade deal with australia another byproduct of brexit you could have um a different maybe the reform party have a different mentality but i doubt it considering um you know nigel farage said we could do trade deals with countries around the world well if you want to get trade deals with certain countries especially when they know you're desperate you're gonna get crap ones but um anyways look i'm gonna leave it there credit to manette batters and the nfu um hope to see more from them in the future let me know what you think in the comments below like comment share subscribe support the channel on patreon if you can and hopefully i'll see you in the next one